Thanks, Naren. You can see my screen and you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thank, firstly, thank, thanks, Naren, and also thanks to ISBN for endorsing your work. Uh, it's, it's an absolute privilege to speak, you know, any sort of symposium that, that is held in the uh, sort of memory of Jim Goodrich. He was a mentor to so many of us, and I think <clears throat> in my case, and in uh, the case of a lot of the people who are speaking here, he was more than a mentor. He was a friend. He was almost paternalistic in the way he, he handled us. Um, <clears throat> So as, as, as has been shown in many of the slides before, we all have, you know, fond pictures of Jim. We all have, you know, memorabilia and his, his extraordinary accomplishments can't really be captured in any, any one, you know, slide or presentation. But I think in my, in my mind, uh, the neurosurgical operative atlas is one of his greater attributes. And if you ever met Jim, he always mentioned his catalog of, of um, you know, extraordinary books and the picture in the, in the right at the bottom there probably encompasses you know a lot of these the picture on top there is one i shared with him i'll tell a little bit more about that at the end of the talk but that was really uh, when he came down to cape town for the, for the ife in 2017. Um, <clears throat> so jim was was instrumental really in my decision to to do pediatric neurosurgery and speaking after Jim Goodrich was always you know, an incredibly unenviable task, even posthumously, I must say, it's quite an intimidating thing uh, to do. But he, 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 like you said, he always knew the right thing, and he, he always knew what the right answer was. And he painted pediatric neurosurgery as this very mystic, magical, almost romanticized you know, subspeciality. And by any comparison, you know, adult neurosurgery just started to pale in comparison, and you felt you were always doing the right thing by becoming a pediatric neurosurgeon. So to, coming back to, to the talk, I think why, why I'm so fond of this very kind of basic aspect of neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, and for the purpose of the, this talk as it uh, pertains to craniosynostosis, is that in most settings, the vast majority of children we treat, I think, present to us later than they should, ideally. Uh, and raised intracranial pressure is the commonest underlying feature of most serious neurosurgical conditions. And I believe it has some unique features when it relates to craniosynostosis as opposed to traumatic brain injury or tumors or hydrocephalus. And I'll try and highlight some of those. So just a few basic facts. About a third of all syndromic craniosynostosis may present with some form of raised intracranial pressure. This number drops substantially with single suture synostosis and varies depending on the type of, of suture involved and depending on who you read and, and, and which thought process you subscribe to. <clears throat> but it's associated with a few sort of pathophysiological processes. And that, the one is the number of fused sutures. Venous congestion has risen to the fore as a big factor, not just in the acondroplastics, but in more of the complex, um, you know, multi-sutural synostosis. Hydrocephalus is an associated cause in some way tied to the venous congestion. And for the more complex syndromic patients, upper area obstruction is a very strong contributor to raise intracranial pressure. Interestingly, though, the more publications that have come out, the less the correlation appears to be between, you know, vault volume, intracranial volume, and intracranial pressure. So the difficulties or the unique features or peculiarities, rather, should I say, are that raised ICP in craniosynostosis appears to have a, a much slower, more protracted clinical course, which makes it a little more difficult to pick up with just the blunt tool of, of clinical assessment. The bony and CSF abnormalities make assessment of neuro-ophthalmological signs inconsistent. And as I'll show a little later, examining the eye has been a very promising way of picking up uh, raised ICP non-invasively. Younger patients also tend to be more uncooperative. They're difficult to monitor. Uh, ventricular dilatation, dilated subarachnoid spaces, the more common things we associate with raised ICP tend to not always uh, manifest that way in patients with craniosynostosis. The issue of impaired CSF absorption along the sagittal sinus, particularly with the sort of narrow bony, bony, bony channel, and uh, it, the thought process being that it impairs the arachnoid villi's ability to, to reabsorb CSF as a contributor to hydrocephalus in this, uh, in this context. A lot of the studies that have been published in this, in this context also use different monitoring uh, modalities. So the probes are placed subdurally, parenchymally, the epidural probes, um, and the, 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 the thresholds that I use for defining raised ICP also tend to be inhomogeneous. <clears throat> but I think largely this paper by Minz um, is probably the, the more widely accepted, but even, even with this, there's a complete lack of universal accepted scale of normal versus abnormal. And what the suggestion here was that in neonates, infants, children, and adolescents, these thresholds differ. And this was what was recommended by, by Minz. But there have been a few uh, protagonists and 
in, uh, some, some believe that in children above the age of one year old, you know, you can use almost adult values for, for determining ICP. So normal is less than 10, borderline is between 10 and 15, and high ICP is considered upwards of 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the Lundberg A and B waves have been used by some who have continuous monitoring software, which is useful for getting a trend. And I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, the trends of ICP are more important than absolute sort of snapshot measurements. Uh, and, and in that context, I think one's, one's got to consider not only the mean ICP or the highest ICP, but things like the frequency, the duration of elevated ICP episodes and moving our thinking rather or morphing our thinking into a more personalized strategy. And this was perpetrated by, by Adam uh, mostly, but there are lots of proponents of this, this way of thinking. So the methods for assessing ICP, I think we're all familiar with, the invasive or non-invasive, and I'll go through some of them very quickly. Invasive monitoring, I think, is, is really the gold standard still. It provides continuous real-time readings. There are various software programs for pattern analyses. And if one has these, I think it provides you with the best platform to make the most informed decisions. They do, however, come with uh, clear disadvantages. So the drift, uh, anywhere between 2 and 7%. Hematoma risk, 1%, but that differs again, depending on, 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 on sort of who, uh, who you read. The infection risk is anywhere from up to 7%, and the risk of CSF leak around 3%. Telemetric ICP monitoring, and the, the, the group, Marian Jula's group, have, have published extensively on this, and they, they've, they've kind of described it to be a safe technique, potentially decreasing the number of invasive procedures. It provides continuous ICP monitoring, so you can pick up uh, day-night variations. These patients are discharged, so they're at home. Uh, it's, it's relatively cost-effective when you compare it to other invasive modalities, <clears throat> but it does require quite a bit of technological development in its current state, and a lot more in the way of clinical um, uh, uh, vetability and experience. So this underscores the need for a, a non-invasive, reliable technique for assessing ICP. And I, I believe in, even in the context of perineal synostosis, this does represent very much a holy grail. So even though invasive ICP uh, monitoring is the gold standard, uh, unnecessary CT scans, as we've heard earlier from, from Jim's talk, actually, the exposure to high doses of radiation is really not that palatable, especially in young kids. We must, you know, or delay diagnosis um, <clears throat> uh, as a screening tool, and we can follow up in our interventions with a reliable non-invasive tool. So BP shunts, uh, endoscopic procedures, hematoma evacuations, skull vault remodeling, and it may potentially allow us within the critical care environment to, um, to not have to move patients out of that environment and sort of, sort of negates the risk associated with that. So there are a number of non-invasive techniques. Firstly, the clinical assessment, which is really a blunt tool, not standalone, but a lot of us do rely on that. <clears throat> this is often coupled with radiological findings, both CT and MRI. Uh, the natural bony windows, particularly the transorbital route, there's been a lot of work done on that portal, but also the audiologic, so uh, across the ear. And in little kids, the anterior fontanelle is really the best marker of raised ICP. <clears throat> there are fluid dynamic techniques, the most so reputable of these, I believe, is the transcranial Doppler, but things like near-infrared spectroscopy and sophisticated MRI uh, fluid dynamic techniques have also come into their own recently. And then electrophysiological techniques for completeness, things like visual evoked potentials and uh, spectral EEG. So the eye is, is kind of, I think, uh, almost uh, um, rooted itself as a great portal for, for diagnosing raised ICP. Again, clinical assessment, and I'll go through some of these techniques just to highlight those which are relevant and may in the future become you know, options that we could use to non-invasively assess ICP. So you're looking at things like ocular pressure manometry, quantitative pupillometry, prom probably the most uh, promising of all is something called optical coherent tomography. Uh, visual evoked potentials, uh, venous ophthalmodynamometry, which is also described in the context of, um, of, of cranial synostosis, really, and then some ultrasound-based techniques. So the clinical assessment we're all, all aware with, you know, the neurological exam and its basics, the ocular abnormalities, things like sixth and third nerve palsies, relative afferent pupillary defects or light near dissociation. We've gotten into the habit now of routinely getting our, our kids' uh, visual assessment done <clears throat> both in terms of you know, uh, uh, field loss and acuity, but also fundoscopy, specifically for things like papilledema, optic atrophy, and spontaneous venous pulsation. So there've been a few, few publications, and in the context of cranial synostosis, a lot of them coming from the, the Great Ormond Street group, um, and they've actually felt that in children 
older than um, eight years old with papal edema, it's a sensitive enough sign that ICP monitoring is probably unnecessary in that group. And then to strengthen this finding or add to the diagnostic accuracy, if one adds, and you probably need, not probably, I think you definitely need an ophthalmologist to do this for you, but the absence of spontaneous venous pulsation with papilledema is a much more sensitive marker. So if one is able to capture this, it's an excellent screening tool. And I think rather than helping us decide which patients need to be operated on, it's probably more helpful in deciding which patients don't need to be operated on. The radiological assessment, uh, we're familiar with these as well, compressed basal systems or ventricles, suture diastasis, uh, enlarged ventricle subarachnoid space, Luchen scardal or the copper beaten skull, uh, cell erosion and venous congestion. And, and a lot of these have been described, but it's the, the ones that have been highlighted there, or unhighlighted rather, that have, have, have demonstrated the best radiological sensitivity and correlated well with uh, raised ICP as, as was monitored on invasive uh, measurement. So the techniques for transorbital assessment of ICP, pupillometry, quantitative pupillometry using an infrared uh, pupillometer. <clears throat> so the normal pupil de uh, size decreases about a third in standard light stimulus. But once your ICP rises above 20 millimeters of mercury, this response is reduced to below 10%. And there is quite a bit of literature, review articles as well, systematic reviews, uh, suggesting that this is a useful technique as a screening tool for picking up raised ICP. Intraocular pressure measurement, again, a very portable, very simple technique. Uh, the pool diagnostic accuracy suggests that I, uh, intraocular pressure measurement on its own is not uh, uh, suitable for predicting absolute individual ICP, but it seems to be useful uh, for predicting you know, trends over time. The difficulty here is uh, glaucoma, but the, uh, um, uh, uh, an um, increasing trend has been in defining what's called the translaminar pressure gradient. So working out the pressure on either side of the retina. So intraocular and in, within the optic nerve sheet. Optical coherence tomography, like I said, is a really sort of fast developing and very popular technique. The limitation is that the machine still isn't uh, portable enough to be taken to the patient. But I understand that in time this, this or at least it, it, it's, it's on the cards that these machines will be more portable so we can actually scan patients at the bedside. Uh, it's a light-based technique, uh, so it picks up opaque or translucent materials, measures the thickness of the retinal fibers as a marker of underlying pathology like raised ICP, and it provides the highest resolution imaging quality available, so much better than MRI scan. You can see what a patient with papilledema looks like over there compared, compared to one that, that, that's normal over, uh, over here. And you can segment these. You can do all sorts of uh, research analyses on that. So apart from just being a diagnostic clinical tool, there's great research potential as well. Uh, visual evoked potentials, I add this for, for completeness sake. Again, from the, 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 the Great Ormond Street group, um, I think they've published more than one paper on this, but flesh response, visual evoked potentials, if the mean latency should be in healthy patients, you know, about 130 milliseconds. If this is prolonged, it's suggestive of raised ICP. They also use something called pattern reversal uh, visual evoked potentials and the de defined criteria there for raised ICP. The difficulty is it requires extensive neurophysiological expertise. The test itself takes around half an hour to 40 minutes. So it's quite labor intensive and you can't really, uh, you know, it's not effective as a continuous monitoring tool. So it takes quite a, quite a long while to provide you with a snapshot assessment. Venus of Thalmodynamometry, again, was interesting in its time. And this paper by, by, by Raymond Fushing basically you know, established it as a, as a, as a um, diagnostic option. But you've got to apply a suction cup to the globe and to increase the intraocular pre uh, pressure until the central retinal vein collapses. It needs to be performed by an experienced ophthalmologist, but there's been described sort of oculocardiac reflexes to this. And in patients with, um, where, where it causes hypotension and in the patient with intracranial pressure, that's questionable. That's quite undesirable. The fluid dynamic measurement techniques, there are a few of them. I'm just gonna focus on transcranial Doppler because of its central role and wide usage. It measures cerebral blood flow velocity through major intracranial vessels. With raised ICP, uh, cerebral blood flow is affected and that affects the velocity, so the velocity goes up. And there are various indices and ratios that will be used to measure that, the pulsatility index, resistance index, Lindergaard ratio. It provides very much a qualitative estimate of ICP, there's so, so low, normal, and high ICP, but there's a lot of disparity regarding its relationship with absolute ICP. So it's likely a useful first-line examination tool in the emergency department, but for long-term follow-up, it's questionable. 
Um, but certainly there's more published on the use of transcranial Doppler than any other technique. MR elastography is a fancy software related technique. I've included it for, um, for completeness, but really the software is prohibitively expensive. So it's not that simple. And then in our experience, perhaps the most useful, simple, reproducible technique involves uh, you know, assessing the optic nerve sheath. So you place a probe over the eye, provides an ultrasound image, and that's what it looks like. So that's the globe, that's the nerve sheath. And there's been quite a bit of data uh, showing that the relationship between optic nerve sheath diameter and uh, raised ICP is a fairly linear, fairly robust, fairly sensitive one. However, it does come with certain limitations in terms of defining the absolute sort of best cutoff. And this is some of the work that, that, that are really trying to stratify ICP in terms of you know, increments of five and what the associated optic nerve sheath cutoff uh, diameters were. Again, serves as a good screening tool, but as a continuous monitoring tool, it has some, some limitations. So all of these techniques have the same limitation. They're a poor quantitative assessment of ICP. They have limited diagnostic accuracy. Uh, they're inadequate in their current form as a continuous monitoring tool, and they provide just a spot measure of ICP. Use the variability as well is quite, a, quite an important shortcoming because people need to be trained uh, to do the perform the techniques pro properly. Fortunately, there are some efforts involved to try and improve the accuracy. Uh, some of these are the blood flow velocities, something called two-depth transorbital Doppler, and I'll show that briefly, some of our own work on deformability index, and then acoustic analysis, measuring the ultrasound response of the cranium itself. So this technique uh, got quite a bit of <clears throat> uh, media attention, um, and has been, there's quite a bit of publication about it. Uh, it uses the principle of a uh, uh, sphygmonometer to measure the blood pressure, so applying you know, pressure to the globe to affect the flow in the extracranial ophthalmic uh, segment so that it equilibrates to the intracranial version. And uh, you know, that would be then a marker. So the amount of pressure you then apply on the globe is the same as the intracranial pressure. Initial publications showed a very high diagnostic accuracy. They also claim to have you know, no need for calibration but subsequent validation have shown much poorer diagnostic accuracy. So quite a bit of work st still needs to come out of that. Uh, some of our work describing the pulsatility of the optic nerve sheath has also shown you know, a good relationship if you can uh, fine tune, not just the snapshot of the, of the optic nerve sheath, but the flow related pulsatile expansile nature of the optic nerve sheath. So how stretchable it is. And that formula has shown to be uh, reasonably consistent with ICP. So to summarize then in this context, the raised ICP in cranial synostosis, one has to bear in mind is multifactorial. So it makes the decision-making curve and the treatment in algorithms quite complex. It may occur in single suture or syndromic cases and the incidence differs between the two. Uh, invasive monitoring in its current form is still the gold standard, but a non-invasive tool that's reproducible, that's accurate, that can provide you know, continuous assessment still remains the holy grail. And like I said, the important thing there is probably in selecting outpatients who are not candidates for surgery. Adequate imaging is inc incredibly important. You need to demonstrate the venous anatomy, especially in, in cases of venous stasis or congestion because of the tendency to develop collaterals, especially uh, in the posterior fossa. Surgical planning and strategies need to be modified to individual cases. I think that's a fundamental principle, but perhaps more applicable here than in any other case. And then routine follow-up, as we've heard in, in the talk that just preceded this, at least up to the age of five years old, because some of these kids can develop uh, raised ICP um, you know, later on in their lives. And I'd like to just just end by showing some of these slides. So this is, um, <clears throat> so Jim, we all know, was one of the world's leading neurosurgical thinkers in terms of uh, you know, artifact collection and special collection of, of antiquities. So when he came down to Cape Town, what he insisted on doing was going to see the Chris Barnard Memorial um, Center at Hurdeskir Hospital. So myself and, and Graham Fegan took him across there. And at the time I knew, you know, I knew Jim pretty well. I knew he was an incredibly you know, interesting character with a diverse knowledge of, of a whole spectrum of things. And all, all he said to me was, yes, I'll definitely come down for your meeting as long as you take me out to the Winelands, you know, the day after that and we go for a drink. And that's exactly what we did. And I put this, uh, this was a publication that after Jim had passed away. And I'm sure that was written by a guy called Ottavio Tomasi and uh, calling Jim the most interesting man in the world. And at the time, I had quite a complex decision-making curve in my own career, and, and Jim's advice was one of the kind of pillars of my decision-making. And he said to me, well, 
you know, emotion affects us quite strongly, but remember whatever you do, it's always up, never sideways and never down. And I've adopted that as, as a policy in kind of driving, driving my career. And we can all say lots of things, but in this publication, I think where Tomasi quoted the words of, of Wayne Drash, who was a former CNN Emmy Award winning journalist. And he was present at, uh, you know, Jim's separation of the McDonald twins. And he, this is what he wrote. He said that legacy was on display in the operating room with the twins. Goodrich led the team of more than 40 doctors, nurses, and medical personnel. Instead of making the final cut to separate the twins, Goodrich stepped aside and allowed another member of his team that honor. We are official, Goodrich said, after his junior colleague made the final historic cut, the room burst into applause. And I think that sort of summarizes Jim as much as any one of us can try to do. He was larger than life. He was humble. He had a fantastic sense of humor. But more than anything, he was a humanitarian. Um, and with that, I'd like to, to, to thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Padachi, on that important uh, topic, particularly for uh, neurosurgeons who deal with craniofacial conditions. And um, I think this will be a very useful uh, reference. And certainly, you know, when we see patients, uh, parents with children with craniosynostosis, and uh, the the intracranial pressure does become an issue uh, or when we talk them through to get the consent i think a method that does that is not uh, invasive would be very useful and and thank you very much for that excellent talk and also sharing with us how much uh, dr goodridge was not a, not only a mentor friend uh, and an inspiration thank you thank you very much